Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Code Emporium where we continue our discussion in building out a transformer neural network for translating from English to another language called Kannada. It's a fun South Indian language that I'm actually going to be delving into in this video. Throughout our discussion, we've kind of highlighted a lot of the core components of the transformer neural network and also its architecture. That's all fun stuff, but I also want to get a better understanding of how we're going to typically process input tokens such that it can be eventually fed into the transformer neural network. So let's get to looking at that. So in this Google Colab notebook, I have a couple of files here that consists of the English sentence, which is the source sentence, as well as the target Canada sentence, which is the sentence we want to translate to. Now, if you want to know how that information looks, it kind of looks like this, where this is the Canada file, where there's about like, I believe like 4 million records over here. That's 4 million sentences. And then we have a train file over here which is the English translation for every single corresponding Kannada translation over here. So this is he is a scientist. This is the Kannada translation of he is a scientist. And we're, we need to kind of like clean this file, process it, create a data set, and then feed it to our transformer neural network. So the source of this data set is Samanantar. If you want, you can actually kind of read this paper of what it contains, but essentially it has the English translation, so for every English file, there will be 11 files where you have 11 Indian languages, and those languages are, are over here, which are short forms of some of these Indian languages. I am using the KN file, which is the Kannada file, and you can just see like some more details of like what are the number of records, the number of tokens, and whatnot, and also all these like, they, have, they also had benchmark analyses, so I would just recommend that you read this paper for more information. But if you actually want to download this data set, you can hop over to this link, which all of these links will be in the description below. And you can just click like on the downloads and then download everything. I will say a big warning is that there is no good way to download just a single part of these data sets. Like I mentioned, there's like four, these files are pretty large. They're gigabytes of data. And in fact, I think you need about 20 gigabytes of data to download everything. And unfortunately, you only have an option to download everything at once and not just like Kannada English or Kannada Hindi. So I would just recommend that you have some space on your computer before you try to download these. Coming back to our file, we want to define a start token, padding token, and end token. So a start token is going to be to begin a sentence, end tokens to end a sentence, and a padding token is typically used because we want to make sure that even though sentences might be of different number of words or characters, we want to ensure that they are converted into numbers, vectors, matrices that are of the same length. And hence we introduce padding tokens. Next, I'm gonna introduce a Kannada vocabulary, which is a list of a set of all possible symbols that we can input and output to and from the model. And the same is true for the English case. It's the number of characters that can be input and output to and from the model. Let's talk a little bit about these individual languages so that we kind of get an idea and a better understanding of what we can expect moving forward for translation. Now, these English characters here, we have a character set that consists of consonants and vowels, and we call this entire set an alphabet as each character can represent an individual sound. S, k, h, i, n, and so on. Kannada is kind of much in the similar way of we have consonants and vowels, so this first row is a set of vowels, and so is this third row. So that would be a, a, i, i, u, u, ru, ru, a, a, i, o, 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 um, aha. And then we also have a set of consonants. So it's ka, ka, ga, ga, nya, cha, cha, ja, ja, nya, ta, ta, da, da, na, ta, ta, da, da, na, pa, 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 ba, ma. And then ya, ra, la, va, sha, sha, sa, ha, la, sha, ya. So I just read the entire thing. Wonderful. Even though we call Kannada an alphabet when just speaking normally, it is technically more an alpha syllabary where each character here clearly just represents a syllable, at least here, but we can also combine them together. We can combine consonants and vowels to actually create a sound, like a unit here. So for example, this is k plus a, and that becomes ka. This is k plus e, and that becomes ki. This is k plus e, that becomes key. So we're combining a consonant, which is ka, and a vowel, which is one of these, in order to create like different units of characters here. 
And so, Kanada is an alpha syllabary. And like we did for ka, we can do that for every single other consonant and vowel pairing to get a set of these units of consonant vowels. And this is what we call in Kanada a kagonida. And so, since English is more of a phonetic alphabet language, whereas Kanada is more of an alpha syllabary, you can kind of see that there would be some form of complications that can occur when you're translating from English to Kanada. They're very different kinds of styles of writing, so it's fun to keep in mind though. Now, for every single one of these lists of Kanada and English vocabulary, we want to create an index. So that's a dictionary that maps some integer to a character that you see up here, or a character that maps also to an integer. And I'm just creating that index over here. Now we're gonna read these files that we mentioned over here entirely from our Google Drive. And we're only going to pick out the top 100,000 sentences for now, so that's faster and easier to train. We probably don't need 4 million, but if we do need more, we can always pull more by just increasing this total sentences value. And I'm just going to get rid of these new line characters that are appended at the end of each sentence, and then just print it out for you. And so you'll see like the English sentences look like this, and their Kannada translations correspondingly kind of look like this. Now, as an input to this transformer neural network, entirely either the inputs or the outputs, we're actually going to convert every single character into some embedding instead of every single word as we have probably discussed in many videos before. When we encode every single character into an embedding, we want to, ideally it should be a little bit smaller so that there's not too many parameters to learn, inference becomes faster. But over here, you can see that the maximum Kannada sentence, it has 639 characters, while the maximum English sentence has 722 characters. Now, you can go and plot a distribution, but I'm typically sure that you'll see a very long tail curve where there might be only a couple of sentences that are very long, and I don't really want to just accommodate all of those sentences that are just super long. Even There's only like a few of them anyways. I would rather just accommodate the majority and try to decrease my dimensions so that just becomes easier to learn, less parameters throughout the network. And so, what I'm doing is, I'm just trying to see the 97th percentile of like the longest words. So, this is basically saying that there's 172 Kannada sentences in my data set that are less than 172 characters. And there's only like 3% that are more. And with English, we have a very similar size. So, what I'm gonna be doing now is defining a maximum sequence length, that is the maximum number of characters in a sentence should be only 200. Anything more than that, we'll just get rid of from the data set. And so I've just written little helper functions that kind of just check these conditions, right? Whether they're actually, first of all, whether they have valid tokens, that is all of the tokens that are present in each of these lines, is actually a token of the vocabulary that we've described up here. So only, it, only if this is true, and also it has like a valid sentence length, that is, is less than 200 characters, and then those are the ones that we actually use in training the transformer. And so we reduce from 100,000 to just 81,900, which is completely fine. And why it's like such a huge reduction is mostly because both the English and the Kannada sentence translation have to have um, these two parts satisfied. Next, we are going to create a data set. So PyTorch has a predefined class called a data set, which is required in order to feed data and train a PyTorch model. This kind of takes care of a lot of the boilerplate code under the hood so that there's consistency in how we fetch, batch, and everything else with data. And in this case, since we're working with text, we create a text dataset class. And I want to override, we have to actually override when you're creating a custom dataset, a get item, the length, and also um, a constructor if you require it. So in my case, this line is going to be used internally by dataset to get whatever the length of the current sentence is. But whereas get item here is going to take in an index and get the corresponding English and Kannada sentence, which we retrieve when we're going to be training. So we're iterating over a batch. We'll be getting an English sentence and a Kannada sentence. And this function is going to be called to fetch that data. I'm creating a custom dataset because there isn't really, this dataset class doesn't really satisfy my own needs. 
but you can check PyTorch's repository for dataset just to see if what you have is already built in. Otherwise, you can build a custom dataset like we are doing here. And so when you execute dataset and you'll just like get, let's say the, the second element in that dataset, you'll see that you'll return a tuple of the English sentence as well as the corresponding Kannada translation. Now for the sake of this entire setup, let's just say that the batch size is three. Now to explain why we are batching in the first place is that let's say that we just take one input sentence and one Kannada translation as just the batch size. So batch size one, which is essentially no batching whatsoever. So if we pass in one Kannada sentence, an English sentence during training, we'll get some output loss function. And then we're going to be performing back propagation, update all of these like millions of parameters over here in order to now get a new state. And then we will repeat this again with passing another English and Kannada sentence. And again, all of these parameters have to be updated. Updating each and every single parameter for just every single example can take a very long time. And also your lost steps will also be very jaggedy. So in order to speed up this training, we kind of parallelize passing in information to this network. So in this case, I said three. So we can put three input sentences in Canada and English, pass it through the network. And only after all of these have been read, we only generate a single loss. And then we just back propagate that loss. So it's only the parameters are updated once for every three that are input. So we can increase the batch size to decrease the number of times the entire network is going to be updated. And this will speed up training. And hence we use Typically, for many machine learning cases, we use mini batch gradient descent. Let's just say that we set the batch num to three. So what you'll see is actually two tuples of data. So for the first one, you're, you're gonna see three over here. There's three English sentences, one that are comma separated, two and three. And then that's gonna be up till here. And then you'll see the corresponding Kannada translations in another tuple over here. And that's kind of how the data is going to be given and processed during training. Next is tokenization. So we have these sentences, but we need to convert these into numbers because computers don't understand text, they understand numbers. And so I've created this tokenized function over here that'll take a sentence and it'll take also um, whichever language, depending on what you want, either English or Kannada, it'll take that character to number embedding. And it'll take an optional start token and end token, depending on whether we want to pass in a start token or end token. And so if we have a start token, we will append, we will prepend it to the beginning of the sentence. If we have an end token, we will append it to the end of the sentence. And in other cases, you know, we need to have padding tokens. So for the remainder of all of the characters, we are going to just introduce a padding token that we discussed previously. And then just create a torch tensor so that everything, instead of a Python list, it passes a tensor as everything in PyTorch is processed typically with tensors. So to look at an example, let's just say that we have a batch. Since the batch size is three, it has three English and Canada sentences over here. Now I'm gonna describe some empty lists. That is, this is going to be the list of all English tokens in these sentences and Canada tokens in the corresponding sentences. Now for every single sentence, what we will do is we are going to call the tokenize for the English part. But in the English case, I don't want to use start tokens and end tokens. We are passing them all simultaneously anyways, we will have the entire English sentence. So there's no need of a start token and end token. Now for the Kannada case, I need to pass in a start token because during the generation phase, you're not gonna have any Kannada word to start with. So you're gonna have to inject something into the model and that will be your start token. And I'm also gonna pass in an end token as well, just to indicate this is where the sentence ends. And after that, it's just padding tokens. And so you can see that if you look at the Kannada tokenization, so we have like these three Kannada sentences, their corresponding trend, like numeric interpretations would look like this. This is the first sentence, this is the second sentence, and this is the third sentence. So they've all been mapped to, from characters to an index, an integer, from that character integer dictionary that we just created previously. And we can see that these 123s are padding tokens. This 124 over here is an end token, end of sentence, and this zero is a start token. We can see something very similar for, for English too, if we wanted to, to try this out. Where 95 in this case is the padding token, and then we have 
yeah, there's no start or end token, so it's just the padding tokens, and everything else is just characters and the sentences that you see. Now, in the last part of this video, I just wanted to very quickly just touch on masking. Now, coming to this transformer architecture, you'll see that you don't really need a typical type of masking for the encoder part. The only kind of masking you need is a padding mask, and that's just to say, hey, do not look at the padding when you are computing this loss function and upgrading gradient weights here. So don't look at the padding tokens, they mean nothing. So we might need to have like a padding mask interjected within the encoder, but then that is in this multi-head attention part. But with the decoder, you need a mass multi-head attention, which means that in the decoder, since this is the generation phase, you're in the, during training, you have all of your Kannada translation data. But during inference, you don't have any of that. So you shouldn't be looking forward to what tokens you haven't generated. That's a form of data leakage, and we cannot have that. So what we would do is instead we would mask all those tokens and say, hey, any character that comes after this current character, we don't want to look at it. We, sh we have no context to that. We only have the context to characters that come before it. And on top of this, we also have a padding mask that is just masks that like kind of like what you mentioned in the encoder, we just should not be using in order to compute backpropagation up gradient updates. Everything that I've mentioned just now can be kind of converted into look ahead masks and padding masks for both the encoder and the decoder. And I've kind of printed all of these things out here. Now, instead of like a, I'm using zero that says, hey, this is not masked and negative and like a negative large number, or it's just, technically it's like a negative infinity that says, hey, this is masked. Because eventually, if you look at the code, we're going to be passing this through a softmax function right over here. And when you do a softmax, that's essentially like an exponential function. So that's whatever is zero, it's e to the power of zero is going to be one, which is okay, that's passed through. But if it's a negative infinity, e to the zero is going to be zero, which is don't pass through. So that's kind of why we use a negative infinity zero instead of like zero one. And I specifically do not use negative infinity and use like a very low negative number instead because there will eventually be cases where your entire rows are just zeros. And if all your rows are zeros during a softmax, that means the output of softmax is gonna do zero by zero. This is gonna lead to NANs or numerical instability. And if you get that as a NAN, then the output loss is also going to be a NAN, not a number. And this is just not trainable. And so I just instead just inject very little information into it. And this is effectively not gonna change your model too much. And hence I do it here. The output of this though, and you can try this out, is that, well, you'll get an encoder self-attention mask as zeros means that pass through until the character that you see, um, and then you'll just get negative infinities. Then the decoder self-attention mask, you'll see that it's a look ahead mask. So, only the first one is zero, everything else is going to be, you know, negative infinity. Here, only the first two, are in the second row, only the first two are zero. In the third row, only the first three are zero, and so on. And then we have like a decoder cross attention mask, which is kind of more similar in that it has a padding mask like the encoder self attention mask here. I've put all of this actually together in a very cute class of a function which we call sentence embedding, where I have oh, this wonderful set of operations that I'm going to be performing. Um, you'll notice that there's a lot of like dropout, positional encoder. And I'm going to be integrating this in my next video into the actual transformer code. So be on the lookout for that. And I also have this uh, batch tokenization. So we have a tokenization function. Everything that I've written out, I've encapsulated in a function to handle batches of data. That's going to do it for this video. And I'm going to continue the series as we have been for the last 10 or 12 videos. And this will go for a few more videos as I continue to build the entire transformer from scratch in order to translate from English to a language called Kannada. All the resources I mentioned are going to be down in the description below. So do check out those links. And thank you all so much for watching. And I will see you very soon in my next video on Transformers because we love them. Goodbye.